there is a whole scheme here of uh, uh, changes which are being made inside the REACH revision. I think Sylvain covered uh, really uh, very transparently what, what, what they're thinking on. Um, uh, but you, you can see again that this is not uh, a point-by-point -point change that is being made. It's a holistic approach to the concept of how REACH should be managed. Um, one of the things, uh, oh yes, that <laughs> The little change due to uh, the fact that the Commission announced uh, that the REACH revision wasn't going to be published, I just wanted as an aside to mention it doesn't mean that nothing is happening because there are some things that are still being done by the Delegated Act process, uh, like some work on, on, on low tonnages, obviously GRA, which uh, Sylvain has mentioned, uh, and I think also on the reform of authorization, some of the things will progress regardless of uh, the uh, uh, the, the fact that the legislative proposal is not there yet. Um, again, if you look uh, at the, uh, and now I have to put on my own glasses to read my own slides here, sorry. Um, the, the, the restrictions uh, and uh, the, the REACH review fit in the, in the redesign of a larger uh, architecture, uh, which will shift competences uh, which will have impacts beyond the EU market, and this is very much intended. Uh, and it will also facilitate certain things for industry by providing a more centralized approach to the assessment uh, of chemicals. So overall, uh, the aims of what's being attempted here are positive. Uh, this is again a chart uh, uh, stolen from, the, from, the, from ECHA. I absolutely love this chart because I think it's so beautiful. It's really the art of chemistry. Huh? We're here, we're surrounded by Klimt. Uh, this is almost as beautiful. Uh, the grouping uh, approach really should uh, be boiled down to the, the, the bullet point on the left there, which is they want to understand by 2027 what group of chemicals need to be managed. So the process that we're in today we actually really guide you to say, okay, these are the things I need to pay attention to uh, in my own organization, my company. Uh, uh, the future expansion of SVHC, at least to me from a meta perspective, look much more pleasing and much more logical that you can also find your way. Uh, you know, you may not like it. You may say, oh, my endocrine disruptor is not so bad or my skin sensitizer is not so bad, but at least it's much more predictable and less ad hoc in the way that uh, the, uh, the assessment is, uh, is made. So whilst you know, it will definitely mean work for us, I think overall it is a simplification and a facilitation of our work uh, in future. So uh, this is a little bit mean uh, perhaps because <laughs> there is a concern uh, that uh, GRA, uh, via GRA or not uh, via GRA, <laughs> Uh, might lead to a lot of restrictions <laughs> being, uh, being put forward. Uh, I'm not going to make any jokes uh, about this, but uh, there is a real concern uh, that the Article 68.2 restrictions are uh, perhaps a little bit a simplistic way to get to a goal. I think Sylvain tried to put your mind at rest uh, that it will be used only if there is a real risk to a particular use. I'm not so 100% convinced. I think this is uh, something that needs to be tested uh, in practice because with non-threshold substances like endocrine disruptors, exposure equals risk. So I can get very quickly uh, to a risk and then it becomes a little bit a question of opinion about whether this is a good thing or not to, uh, to, to restrict. Obviously, there is also the, the, the classic uh, uh, restriction process which would involve the application of OSOA that's a good thing because right now there's quite a few differences of opinion between ECA and EFSA or EMA and EFSA, for example. Uh, so I think that should, should benefit uh, us overall. But this will certainly play a role for all of us in practice in the coming years. And whether it's going to be a, a big wave, like the big wave of Kanagawa from Hokusai, or maybe a small wave, uh, remains to be seen. But for sure there's a lot of work uh, involved here. So. Uh, the essential use angle, and I'm sorry, Christina, I'm going to <laughs> steal some of your, uh, your presentation, maybe. Um, the, the definition there uh, that we're working with at the moment is relatively short, but there is a lot to unpack in it. In fact, so much uh, that I couldn't do my presentation in time if I, if I went through all of them. There are some backup slides in the set for me where you can, you can look at more detail. 
to go through it at a very high and very quick level, they, uh, the definition speaks of most harmful. What is most harmful? Well, you are all specialists in this room. You know this. This is the SVHC. These are the hazardous uh, substances, the ones of the greatest concern. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, we don't need to go through, through the list of them, but it's the usual suspects. There is, of course, an exemption based on health and safety, and uh, I thank Stephen uh, for that, for reminding us that the essential use concept first came in the Montreal Protocol, and that idea was very much based on health, because the exemption they were trying to create was for buffers for people who have asthma. Uh, and so, uh, of course, uh, anything related to health and safety could be considered uh, essential. And this seems to be fairly straightforward. I mean, I don't think we need to debate endlessly what that might mean. Uh, then there's the question of what is critical for society. And it goes hand in hand with, uh, with, with the next one. I think the important thing to consider here is that by including these criteria, like providing resources or services which are, which are critical for society, uh, there has been a considerable widening of what is considered essential. So there are openings in the essential use part. Uh, and of course, if there are uh, alternatives or if there are uh, no alternatives, they need to be technically and economically feasible. I think this remains a very important part that this has been written in. They should obviously be safer. <laughs> You know, there has been some pretty stupid substitutions uh, throughout the years, and I think we really should avoid uh, those. Uh, and the top part is also uh, important. The function and the level of performance should be sufficient. So, you know, I think you have a lot of grounds not to be afraid of the essential use concept, but instead to consider, is my use really essential in this, uh, in this case uh, or not? Now, it's a case-by-case -case determination for the alternatives based on the, on the function uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the use. And people are saying, well, but this is completely contradictory to the socioeconomic analysis angle. And I think this is a wrong dichotomy that is being presented here. Uh, because in fact, uh, under uh, SEA, if something is essential, uh, then the profit is essentially infinite. So it's just a shortcut uh, to have, avoid a full uh, SEA. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the basic equation of uh, socioeconomic uh, analysis, which is a cost-effectiveness analysis, is still valid, except that the, uh, the benefit could be deemed uh, infinite. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to realize uh, that uh, your business is right at the center of all of these regulations, uh, and that uh, my key a recommendation to you is know your substance. Invest in figuring out where emissions and exposures occur. If you have a potentially hazardous substance, I wouldn't even say if you have an SVHC, if you even suspect that you might get into that category, it's, worth, it's a job worth doing. Check what alternatives there are. If there are none, try and already create a justification for that. Run an analysis, whether it's essential or not. There's a decision tree, uh, I'm sure, that will be provided for the, for the essential use concept, but also an SCA. A mini SCA is not such a, such a huge exercise as to be so, so, so difficult. And if you need to substitute, because if your cost-benefit ratio is low, you should really consider, I should substitute. And so invest in that and have that ready uh, ahead of the time that the regulatory process starts, starts running. And I would like to make one point. The MCCP restriction was, was mentioned. Um, some downstream users said we need a longer review period for, or derogation period for uh, the MCCP restriction. And these are very specific downstream users. The answer of the committees was, well, the main manufacturers, in this case of cables, have said we don't see a problem. And this is exactly where uh, I think what Silva mentioned could come in very useful. If the downstream users had been able to communicate earlier, like saying, oh, hold on a second, my situation is special, then the upstream manufacturer who makes cables for everybody would have been able to uh, report on this beforehand. And here, this difference was being used to divide and rule and say, in my opinion, not justified, but OK, you know, I'm not uh, SEAC, to say what you say is not confirmed by the manufacturer. 
uh, and so I'm not going to take it into account. I think you know, those are the sort of outcomes which are very undesirable and which could have been avoided. Anyway, I've just overrun my time, but I think only by a minute, so thank you.